Well, welcome to Wednesday. Hello, hello, hello. And welcome to the beginning of December. Can you believe that we've finally reached the last month of this uh, wild and woolly year? Finally, welcome to the next in our Recreational FNI Success webinar series. Today, focused on 100% turnover. We'll follow the same format, uh, same rules apply. You're free to uh, ask questions. You can type them in. This will be recorded and it will be available afterwards and I'll be publishing links. So we'll spend a little bit of time uh, just going over our focus. I'll we'll have a great, fantastic guest interview today. Uh, and then we'll wrap things up and talk about what's coming up. So 100% turnover. 100% turnover, that is the target. 100% turnover drives profit. And it's discipline everywhere in the store from the top down that makes it happen. 100% turnover. So let's review very quickly what makes up F&I success. Again, it's continual improvement making more profit tomorrow than you did today. And when you hit your goals, you move the goalposts and keep growing. So 8% plus F&I gross profit on your amount financed, minimum target. 4% F&I net profit on unit sales, minimum target. 65% penetration on protective products. Absolute minimum target, and that is both cash and finance. And then 100% turnover. You have not achieved FNI success without achieving 100% turnover. So let's start out with the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Why 100% turnover? What makes it so darn important? Well, the first thing is it ensures that every customer gets the same awesome experience. The second thing, you cannot maximize your F&I profit without 100% turnover. If you're not turning over those cash buyers to someone who can present and, and, and make those uh, protective products real, valuable and viable for your cash buyers, you are leaving money on the table. And then finally, 100% turnover is actually needed to remove and prevent potential legal or financial risk. It's a, it's a thing that people don't think about, but it's why class action lawyers exist. If you're not doing 100% turnover, and you're not doing it, for example, because cash buyers are not being turned over 100% of the time or nearly 100% of the time. Well, now they are not receiving the same presentation and the same options to obtain all the protective products as your finance customers. So now you've artificially created two classes of buyers. Well, now take that next step further and imagine that because those cash buyers didn't get some of the warranty options, something happens that would otherwise have been protected. Well, best case is you're going to be responsible for that cost. Worst case is if it happens to a few customers and they talk to each other, you could be staring at a class action lawsuit. Don't take the chance. Remove your risks, remove your potential legal risks, remove your financial risks, and make sure that you're doing 100% turnover. So what it means, every customer sees your finance or your business manager or your delivery coordinator or whatever you're choosing to call that person but every customer sees them. Every customer gets a 
persuadable opportunity, meaning they get a very real conversation that allows them to change from I'm paying cash to let's look at financing, at least explore the options. And then every customer is presented with all the relevant protective product options. Now, when I say relevant, clearly gap protection is not important to a cash buyer. It's not even available. Clearly, mercury protection is not available on a Yamaha engine. But your FPC products, your interior exterior products, your tire and road hazard products, all of those products are viable options for every one of your customers. And every customer, no matter how they're purchasing their unit, their boat, their RV, no matter how they're paying for it, they deserve the option. And they deserve the benefits obtained by purchasing protective products. So every time, all the time, and cash turnovers have to happen before agreements are finalized. Your salespeople can't be signing agreements, taking a check, and then going and saying, oh, I want you to meet Bob, our, our, business, a certain, our business manager. He's got some things to talk to you about. The business manager has to be the one that finalizes all the paperwork. Now, this can be challenging. If you're a multi-location store and you share a single finance manager among multiple stores so multiple locations. So for some of the locations, your business manager or finance manager is remote. If you're using a service provider, your business manager or your finance manager is remote. It doesn't change the rules. There are tools available to allow an immediate video link Maybe it's Zoom. There's a product that I personally love. It's called Groovio, G-R-U-V-E-O.com. It doesn't require installation. It's, it's links and it works great. But that connection, the conversations with your business manager or finance manager must, must, must happen before the check is written, before papers are signed. That has to happen every single time. So how do you make 100% turnover happen? Well, first, it starts at the top. You as the owner, you as the general manager, you as the general sales manager, it's got to be a policy. And everybody has to know it and everybody has to buy into it. 100% turnover is the star policy. Now, sales knows, your sales team has to know that 100% turnover is not a good idea. It's not a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's policy. And, and sales has to believe that ultimately that 100% turnover is going to be good for them. And frankly, if you get salespeople who ultimately just say, you know what, I just don't believe it. There are plenty of other places for them to go to work. Now, what makes this work is having finance people, business managers, delivery coordinators who know and meet their targets and their excellence at what they do makes it easy for sales to trust them. Sales will know that your business manager will practice the Hippocratic Oath of F&I first do no harm. They are never going to turn over a customer who in concept has agreed to a purchase and then walk that person out the door without a purchase. They won't let that happen. They also are aggressive and graceful in retreat. They know that you never get more than what you ask for the first time. So they will be aggressive and persuasive in presenting protective products. They will try to maximize profit. Now, as, as management, it's a great idea 
to help sales feel encouraged by sharing some of the profit or just do a, a flat, you know, $75, $100 kicker every time one of your cash buyers walks out having talked to the business manager with a protective product purchase. But you have to have your finance and your sales teams aligned. They have to trust each other. Finance has to know that your salespeople know how to tee up the protective products. And your salespeople have to know that your finance manager knows how to protect the customer and then maximize that profit. And everybody needs to know that the finance goal is 4% or more F&I net profit on the unit sales and 65% penetration rate or more on protective products, cash and finance. Now, part of this is the process and the introduction. And one way to greatly simplify the flow and to make this all very natural for the customer is for your salesperson, as soon as they've met that customer, before they've started looking at units or doing any of the actual sales work, they say, oh, uh, Mr. Customer, I just wanna introduce you to Bob. He's our business manager. And as soon as we've figured out what you've fallen in love with, you're gonna be spending some time with him just to go over all the details get you taken care of and get this delivery to happen smoothly and as quickly as possible. And you do that at the beginning. So now Mr. Customer knows that when they're done looking at the units, they're gonna go talk to Bob. And if Bob is not around right now, you still have that conversation. Say, oh, but you know, Bob is, is actually remote, but we'll be hooking you up with him real time as soon as as soon as you're excited about what you're getting. If you do that early introduction, now your customer knows that there's no other conversation to be had. They've finished one part of the process, they move on to the next. It's natural, it's the way it works in your store. That's what makes F and I 100% turnover a success. And now we're gonna get on with our interview with Jan Kelly, who you are going to find just absolutely fascinating. Well, I couldn't be more excited about our guest expert today. Uh, Jan Kelly is someone who I've known of and about for a long time. She has over 40 years of experience. And Jan, I just want to welcome you and thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure, Merle. So Jen has, as I would say, over 40 years of experience in the finance and insurance industry. Over 30 years ago, she started and is the CEO and president of Kelly Enterprises, which uh, is an organization that's designed to be a full service F&I sales and training consulting company, uh, really focused on helping teach and educate dealers in the RV, marine, power sports, uh, and auto industries, uh, kind of best practices and how to make the entire f process more uh, efficient, more productive, and more profitable for the dealerships and, and their associated business partners. Um, she is an acknowledged industry expert. Everybody who's been in this industry at all knows about Jan Kelly. And she's been published, she's spoken, she's facilitated 20 groups. Um, I mean, honestly, if it's about F&I and Jan doesn't know it, it's not a question that exists. So, hey, Jan, with that, um, We'll jump in. Again, I appreciate you being here. But, but let's kind of start out. Our topic for this webinar is 100% turnover. And um, first of all, I think that's a topic, especially lately, I've been hearing about it and talking about it more and more and more. And yet, and yet the execution of it seems to still be 
problematic. So why do you think that is? And what can people do about it? And the second part of this question, which is not exactly related, but, but it might be, is there's some conversation about whether the finance manager should be referred to as a finance manager, a business manager, a delivery coordinator. Do you think that matters generally? And do you think that matters specifically as it pertains to 100% turnover? Or maybe it varies by industry. Well, uh, Merle, can we take this in, in uh, two parts? Absolutely. Your first part of the question you asked, uh, why is the 100% turnover not as uh, pronounced or not as closely followed as it should be? Um, you know, I battle that every time I walk into a dealership. And, and quite frankly, it's a lack of a consistent process. And sometimes that's a sales manager that is A, not compensated off of F&I revenue, so they really don't care about F&I revenue. And in that case, the owner really needs to sit down with the manager and say, do you want to still be a sales manager? Because this is our plan. This is what is expected. And you will support the finance office or you will not be the sales manager. And thank you very much for sharing. And that's the end of that. All right. A lot of times the sales managers get so overwhelmed with the influx of business since this coronavirus thing hit that they just got people lined up after their door and they're just after the next deal. That finance manager can certainly be a wonderful partner if the sales manager will let them. They can quite often close that deal with people who are just on the fence thinking, oh, I might want it, I might not want it. Mm, does it fit my budget? I wonder what the rate is, oh my gosh. All the questions that they have in their mind, but obviously they're not articulating and certainly the salesman and sales manager would not know because they have not run the credit report. Uh, so they're, they're shooting arrows in the dark. So it's just as easy for that salesman to say, oh, but you know, you can come in and bring in cash or, oh, you can come in and bring in your own money from the credit union. That'll save you gobs of time when you're here at delivery. The other thing is that more and more of their deals are being closed over the phone and online. And today's customer shops online for the exact floor plan they want. And that's because their orders are so far in the future that they can order it, but holy cow, it takes a long time to get it. Well, if they go online, search for a particular floor plan, they can find an, a dealer that has that. Then it's just a matter of contacting them, get on the phone, them either driving to the, the dealer or arranging for the delivery to take place in their driveway. That turnover for the remote customer is really a challenge. Because now the sales department has to have faith, faith in the unknown. And that's scary for a lot of them. So how do you overcome that? That's with a sales manager and a finance manager working in tandem to establish and maintain a consistent process. And that's going to take that finance manager time in a sales meeting to role play in front of the salespeople so the salespeople will have confidence in what's being said to their customer. Uh, I know when, when I do training, this year it's been at dealerships kind of one-on-one, -on -one. we role play, I mean, me and the finance manager over and over and over that conversation with the consumer who they cannot see. And I get them to invite them to a Zoom meeting or a go to meeting to where they can establish a line of sight. I've created PowerPoint presentations with their products so they can have, just like flipping through the old presentation book, so they can give the customer something to look at. So all of the finance details can be arranged prior to the customer getting there. But that takes the sales department making that contact with the customer ahead of time. As soon as that customer says, yes, I want that unit. Yes, that price is, is grand. Yes, I can afford that. 
yes, I would agree to, to the trade value. Within 10 minutes of that customer making that decision, they're online shopping for money. So in a lot of cases, they may say cash to, to the dealership, but it's really coming from somewhere else. And what a lot of uh, sales managers and salesmen don't represent is that if that customer has to liquidate their investments to pay for that RV or that boat, that's going to cost them a minimum of 10%. I mean, their little financial broker just takes 10% right off the top and says, thank you very much for your support. And yes, you didn't go out there shopping. That's great. Because whether they have put money into the investment or take money out of the investment, usually that investment guy makes 10% or whatever their contractual fees are. But it costs that customer money and opportunities to pay cash. So that's really not doing the customer a favor. They need to get the finance manager involved as quickly as possible. Even if it's just a soft introduction, that's a start. Now, the next part of your question was, uh, it doesn't matter what the finance person is called. Yes, <laughs> all right. A delivery coordinator to me as a clerk that does nothing more than print forms and get signatures. They don't sell, they don't handle any, any objections. There is no, they're a support person, all right? Um, and there's sometimes that sales manager and finance manager, they are two separate but equal departments. They need each other. One cannot do it by themselves especially in the internet world, uh, because a lot of those dealers are still selling things on the internet at far below their margins that they used to hold. So finance income is essential for the health of every dealership. Merle, did I give you enough there to chew on? Sure. Yeah, you did. Um, so one of, the, one of the concerns, and the reason I asked that question about what the finance manager is is called or referred to. One of the concerns that I hear about oh, Merle, is, you're you're fading in and out. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. So is this better? Can you yes. Okay. Okay. One of the concerns that is expressed to me, particularly in the marine and the RV space, is that at some level that finance office and finance manager have been a little bit poisoned for the customer by an experience in a franchise car dealer. And so they're wondering if it's not possible, maybe to use the business manager term, something to take some of the fear and resistance and make it more natural for that customer to be talking to somebody else. Well, now let, let's talk about the terminology here because uh, when I was in finance, I was always a sales business manager, all right? And that word sales business manager separated me from the business manager who was a controller. But in today's dealerships, all right, the receptionist doesn't, uh, I would say screen all the calls, if, efficiently, they'll just say, can I speak to the business manager? And they really need to be speaking to the accounting office about a bill and finance gets it. And finance doesn't know what to do with it. So they go, well, can you just call me the finance manager because I handle the financing? Well, yes, but they also take care of the business of getting that unit title, getting that the trade title into the dealership they have to follow the funds. So they follow, follow that deal all the way until the money is into the dealership's bank account. So personally, I prefer sales business manager. Now, um, I have a, a client who's up in Canada. He doesn't want any manager. So his, his business de uh, uh, department, sales business managers, they're known as uh, financial presenters, all right? That's okay. I mean, a financial presenter is, is a professional way of saying we've got somebody here that's professionally trained who can talk to you about the business of getting this purchase paid for. 
because sometimes we pull a credit bureau and the best thing on it's our inquiry. All right. So we pray the person has money, you know, green uh, with the numbers on the corners and a lot of them. Um, and and I've, I've had some, some business managers do a perfect cash conversion and then they pull that bureau and my gosh almighty, the guy would need to be co-signed by the Pope to get it. All right. <laughs> So, so then he goes, please don't, don't do anything with that money, but uh, we got another idea. And so they go to plan B. Well, plan B is to get a local bank to take their money, hold it as security so they can establish a good credit rating for them. So the next time when he wants to upgrade a unit, he will be in a position to get financed and to get approved at a decent rate. I mean, there's no risk to the local lender because they've got all, they've got the total price locked up in a CD. Right. So that's plan B. So, you know, how you how you refer to the people certainly matters. Um, you know, sometimes people, if they go, oh, I, I, did, I have to send you to the finance person. Uh, well, that term have to is like, oh, my gosh, if I don't do it, I'm going to be shot. Instead of the next part of our process is, is getting the paperwork and the sale documented, our business manager will take care of that. So there's a whole different attitude in scenarios like that. I would agree. Some auto people, their finance department uh, is less than what I would consider honorable. That's one reason why I left that industry. <laughs> and I only have very few auto clients anymore. There's a reason for that. All right. Um, the RV people are different. And if somebody comes in with their guard up, then, then all they got to do is chat with the, the business manager for just a second. If they don't want to come in, the business manager will go out to where they are. I mean, they're flexible. But that's really why it's important for the business manager to be notified of the, of the deal, either by phone, by text. You know, in one dealership I have, they just put out, you know, a, a text to the business office, game on. Game on means there's a deal about to happen. Come to the sales manager's office for details right away. I mean, don't wait. Just come unless you're with a customer. Um, but that sales manager should know where the, the finance person is at all times. Are they with a client? Are they in a meeting? Are they talking with a lender? You know, are they available? Or do they have a web meeting going on? Uh, and so, again, they got to work hand in glove. They got to work as a team. And that's for maximum efficiency for both departments. So you, you, you've, uh, you've talked about that a couple of times, which kind of leads into my, my, my next question. In order for 100% turnover or finance generally to be uh, successful, at the very least, it takes uh, management commitment and some level of trust and confidence between the sales side and the finance side so that the sales guy isn't spending his life worrying about some finance guy throwing sand in the gears and messing up that deal. Absolutely. So, so how, how do you, you talk about role playing, how do you go about trying to instill the management commitment and that, that trust in, inside an organization, inside a dealership? It, it's a two-part uh, question again. Uh, how, how do you do it? First of all, senior management has to say, my friends, this is important. It's important to our organization and this is what we're gonna do, period. If they don't wanna comply, then they can work elsewhere, all right? And I'm, I'm pretty militant on that. They could be the nicest person on the planet, but if they don't support the whole dealership, then that's a problem. Uh, it's a compliance problem, but it more, more important for the dealerships, it's a monetary problem, all right? They're not making the margins that they need to without the finance office. So how do you, how do you foster this other than dictating it? Very easy. You pay them a part of, of the commission to finance or from finance to the salesman and to the sales manager. So I call that share the wealth. 
they have a vested interest. So the better the finance office does, the better they do. Because if, if the store is not holding the front end margins like they used to, then guess what? The salesmen aren't making the money on the sales they used to make. Where are they gonna make up that shortfall? Through the finance office. I mean, and somebody would, you know, when I was in finance, they said, Jan, I mean, why are you paying the salesman $75 every time you sell a service contract? I said, I would pay them $75 for them to be quiet and let me sell it. <laughs> All right. I mean, that way they don't overpromise anything. I can sell it. I know what I've said. I know what we can do. And, and life is good. The customer's happy. Salesman's happy. I'm happy. So it's not necessarily paying the salesman and expecting them to tee it up or sell it. Sometimes we pay them to be quiet. All we want them to do is ask about, golly, on your trade, did you have a service agreement when you bought it? Yes or no? And then, and if the customer says yes, I want to hear, oh, that's good. And then if they said no, oh. <laughs> Did you have protective coatings supplied to the interior of the coach? You know, that stuff has been around for a long time. Did you have it? Uh, uh, no. Oh, is that important? Why, yes. <laughs> that's all I want him to say on the trade. That's it. Because that does two things. First of all, it, it validates the number that that trade comes back with. All right. Either it's worth that little because I kept saying no, <laughs> or it's worth that much because they, they have all those things. And if somebody comes back and says, well, ABC dealership down the line says that that coach is worth 5,000 more, I can look that customer right in the face and say, did they ask all the questions that we did? And the answer is no. So they really didn't give you a true value, did they? Oh, so maybe our number really is the right number. See, those questions, they work for the sales department, but they also plant seeds. So that's all I want the salesman to do. And the other thing is that if their customer comes back and says, well, you know, Fred, uh, Fred's a salesman. Is that service contract really a good, good idea to get? I want that salesman without hesitating to say yes. And many of our customers get them. Hope you did. All right. Otherwise, guess what? You and I both know that that RV and that Marine customer is going to be in the shop and the shop is always smiling. You know why they're always smiling? Because they get paid. <laughs> they get paid either by the warranty or by the service contract or by the customer or by the sales department, but they get paid. They're always happy. That's why they greet everyone with a smile. Hi, come on in. <laughs> Water's fine. So, uh, I, I hope I've answered uh, your question. Yeah, no, you did. Um, so I think if someone, if some, if a customer comes in and they say they want to finance, the turnover is kind of natural because there's no way that's going to happen mm -hmm. without the turnover happening. It's the, it, it is the I'm paying cash customers that generate, I think, the angst and 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 some of the turmoil. Um, so can you talk just a little bit about? Uh, and I think you have, but maybe uh, maybe expand on it a little bit. Why it is so important that the I'm paying cash customers get to the finance office? Well, I, I I'm going to probably um, uh, go in a, a little bit different tack. Why is it important for that finance department to talk to the cash customer? It is critical because in this day and time, it is essential that that customer be able to have and maintain a cash cushion and still have the toys that they want. And they can. Rates are low today still, thank goodness. And, and financing opportunities, the lenders are very, very, very supportive of the RV and marine industries. If there's any way on earth to make a deal, they will make it, all right? What people in the finance office failed to do is they failed to put that customer who's paying cash in an equity position. 
all right? So when they are talking numbers, they need to put that customer in a comfort zone and say, you know, if I only needed some of your money, not all of it, and you could still have an, a, a good healthy cash cushion, would you be interested? I just need two minutes and anybody will give you two minutes. And, and then that finance person needs to bring out their HP 12C, do a cash conversion or have some already pre-made that they can zip on over in an email and say, can I email this to you? I'd like to explain it. And then show them at today's rates, you know, at today's ROI on a five-year CD rolled over a couple of times what that means. Because they're going to have, um, yes, it's going to cost some money to finance, but they're going to have that CD that's making money for them. They're going to have that RV or that boat right there, giving their, their family happy memories. And they're going to have a payment that they can afford because that's the same amount of money they were setting aside to build that nest egg in the first place. So it's critical, critical that they put that deal in an equity position out of the gate. And that means get enough down payment money, initial payment money, all right, that will uh, allow them to only finance 90% of invoice. If they do that, the customer is going to get a, a really sweet rate. And the finance office is going to make all of the reserve. And the finance office will have enough down payment to sell them all of the ancillary products. And the customer is going to be grateful because no matter what, if they wake up and maybe a year and a half from now and that payment's giving them a burr in their saddle, they're going to have the money to pay it off. All right. And, and there's going to not, it's not going to hurt them. If, if God forbid one of them should pass away, this loan is not going to be a burden to the family. They're not going to have to have a fire sale. It all depends on the finance office setting this finance deal up correctly. And that means they got to get enough down payment, not just the minimum, all right? They need to understand that they can get 30, 40% down. So if they're talking about a $150,000 deal, all right, and the guy is talking about paying cash, there's absolutely zero wrong with them getting 50,000 now and financing the 100,000. Because he's got 100,000 sitting in the bank or whatever else investment that he wants to have it in, all right? And that's a plus. I mean, most of the people, once they take that money out, they don't replenish it. I mean, life happens. They, they, they have best intentions. So what we're doing is really setting up a forced savings for the customer because they'll make a payment each and every month. Then making that same payment to themselves in a, in a savings account, eh, maybe, maybe not. All depends. You know, who's calling their name? Uh, fishing tournament, golf tournament, trip to Europe, what? Okay. So I think, I mean, I, that, that's, that, those, that's been some really great information. I, I feel like I'd be remiss if, if, if I didn't. If, if, allow you to expand a little bit more based on your vast expertise. If, if there's just a couple of what you see as sort of regular F&I profit inhibiting behaviors at stores, and that may be 100% front of it, maybe other things, um, what do you see as some of the F&I profit blockers that are most consistent and it can be corrected in, in some kind of reasonably straightforward way? Well, um, I, I don't want to tell tales out of school, but I have a, a client who for a couple of years, they had uh, protective coatings available to them. And every time I ask them how come they didn't sell it, it was well, we don't have anybody in service to apply it. I don't know the code for the computer. Uh, you know, the accounting, where does that go? Is it a taxable item? Is it a non-taxable item? And finally, my voice went up a few octaves as we were all in a, in a conference call. And 
with senior management and they said, well, Jan, you know, what can we do to increase uh, F&I's revenue? And I said, get somebody in service to apply protective coatings, get your damn computer system, and I use that word, <laughs> it, uh, orchestrated to where they've got a line to where finance can input it. It's a taxable item in every state because of labor. And I said, and eliminate the excuses and let's start talking about it and get it on the menu and stop whining finance people. Pull up your boots and let's get it done. And they went, yes, Jan, yes, Jan. Okay, all right. Okay. Well, guess what? You know, out of the next 10 deals, when, when they, they were talking about it, eight of them had protective coatings. Amazing. And of course, the finance office made $1,400 a, a copy per, per thing, which is fair. But service also made some money. Parts also made some money. So everybody's happy. All right. But you ask, what are the things that hinder it? Well, having not doing anything about service. It, you can hire high schoolers to do this. I mean, it's not rocket scientists. Getting your, your computer system to where it, you've got a line for it, where it prints on the forms. I mean, that old excuse just doesn't hold water anymore. It's like, all right, uh, who's your programmer? Do I need to call them? Because I'm up early. I'll call them. You know? And they went, would you do that? And I said, yeah, but you're not going to be happy because I don't talk very nicely to computer programmers. <laughs> but I get the job done. And uh, they go, oh, well, in that case, oh, we'll, we'll talk to them. I go, when? Today. Good. By five, by the end of business, you're going you're gonna to let me know what he says. I said, I know it can be done. It's, it's been done since the 70s. We are now in 2020. All right, there's no excuse. None. Except you don't want to do it. And if that's the case, then you've got you to gotta man up and tell me that. But more importantly, you've got to tell your boss that. Yeah. And he's on the phone right now. All right, no, 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 we want to do it. And I said, that's excellent. Okay, that's, now we got the ball rolling. So it's just a matter of, of everyone deciding, yes, this is a valuable product. Yes, it's good for the customer. Yes, we want to represent it, and we're going to. Not just signing up and saying, oh, yes, that's wonderful. All right, you, you got to follow up. You got to have a process. Who's going to put it on? When is it going to be put on? It's a first visit sale. So again, prior to the customer getting there, then all of this has to be talked about because there is no better time than to put it on before delivery. You would agree with me that that coach is never going to be cleaner than it is when they get it delivered. Right? Yep. So it needs to be applied prior to delivery. Um, I, I just think people, they, they get in a comfort zone and, and sometimes finance managers make so much money that uh, they're comfortable. So once that happens, then they start putting their buying habits into their customers' pockets. Uh, and I've had to tell more than one manager in my lifetime, look, it's not you making the payments. It's them. All you're doing is giving them an opportunity to protect their investment. I said, now, are you going to make up the difference when that thing comes back and it's got stains in it and it's faded and the decals look like hell? Oh, and they want to trade it in to you because guess what? They bought it from you, so you're the one that knows the value of it. How much are you going to step up for that? Then if you know that unit is coming back at some point in time, then don't you owe it to yourself to make that have the best looking unit you can possibly get. You can sell it a whole lot quicker if it looks pretty than if it looks oxidized. And, and they will pay for it. And so it's, it's attitude. It's attitude with financing. I've had finance managers go, oh, Jan, you don't understand our clients. I go, all right. What's so different about your, your clients? 
because I do have some Ferrari clients and I can tell you those boys and girls get dressed one leg at a time, just like I do. There is no spring loaded cowboys that go on the board from the bed to their Levi's and boots. And, you know, I could, if you see that, you let me know because I could sell tickets to that one. <laughs> and they go, oh, well, you don't have to be like that. And I went, well, then what's so different about them? Oh, they have more money than God. How did they get that? Did they work for it? Did they invest it? Was it inherited? Did they find it under a rock? What was it? Was it the curse of Oak Island that they found it, the cave finally? Did they get it? I don't know. What's different about them? Do they want value for the dollar spent? Yes, everybody does. Will they listen? Yes, if you present it in a professional manner and if you don't drag it out and put them to sleep. So, and, and if you're enthusiastic. So if you believe in your product, believe in your service, and if you're committed to giving service to the customer, then all is gonna be well. But it's attitude. You are providing as a finance manager, a service to the consumer and to the sales department. And that is worth everything. That's awesome. That's that's just a fantastic view. And certainly, certainly I see a lot of the things that you've been talking about, and um, you, you couldn't be more correct. Um, well, listen, Jan, I don't want to take up a lot more of your valuable time, but I, again, really appreciate you being here. I think this was an incredibly valuable inf set of information that you gave. So thank you very, very much. You're most welcome. Let me know, and maybe we can do it again at some time. Well, so wasn't that pretty interesting information? Didn't that give you something to think about? So here's the takeaway from all of that. 100% turnover really does matter. It matters for your customers. It gives them a chance to enjoy their lifestyle to the maximum. It ensures they know their options and it matters for you. It matters from a compliance point of view. It matters from a legal and financial protection point of view. It matters from a consistency point of view. And it certainly matters from a profit point of view. So this has gone a little long. We don't have a lot of time for questions. I think the common uh, question that I kind of hear, and I think Jan really addressed it, uh, is some variant on, but just take their money. What's wrong with that? Well, I think we've covered that. What's wrong with it is it's a huge risk to you and it's a huge profit inhibitor to you. So 100% turnover is not just an idea. It's a profitable discipline. And it's a discipline that starts at the top. It increases profit. It reduces compliance and other risks. It changes everything. So please, just do it. 100% turnover, every customer, every time. So that's it. We'll see you in two weeks. Now I will say that the next webinar uh, about the lifestyle um, is on Thursday the 17th instead of on Wednesday. Um, again, I'll be publishing links so that you'll be able to see it. The information's here. Uh, you can shoot me an email and we'll get you uh, get you registered for it. I really appreciate you taking the time again. Um, I hope you have a fantastic start to December, a great holiday season, and we'll see you on the 17th. Thank you very much. <laughs>